So I want to welcome back to What's Up with Prophecy Today. We're scheduled here to have a really interesting uh, topic today, and we're going to be looking at a topic that uh, is important to everyone. This is How Did God Create the Plan of Salvation? And this is a multi-part series. Today will be part 3A, and our next video will be part 3B. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So God's salvation plan is cons consists of four stages. Now this is my separation of this story. I've broken it into four stages so that we can kind of go through this one by one. So stage one I'm calling before man was created. What went on before man was created in terms of the salvation plan? Now number two, I'm calling the teaching plan. And this will get into the sanctuary in the desert as we go through the various uh, rituals and ceremonies that were performed there and all the various furniture and all. So this will be very interesting. So we'll, we'll get into that in stage two. And that's about two videos from here. And then we're going to look at stage three is what I'm calling it. And this one is uh, reviewing the records. So what does this mean? Well, you're going to have to stay tuned for that. But this one will be an eye opener for a lot of people. And then lastly, we're going to look at stage four. And I'm calling this one the final exam. This will be the final exam. And I'll give you a hint on this. Just before Jesus returns. What will our final exam be just before Jesus returns? Well, let's uh, jump in today's study. This is stage one, before man was created. So before man was created. Now, before we jump into that, I just want to have a one slide review of what we learned in our last video. So in our last video, we learned there are three gods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in this text, we're, we're seeing that Jesus, when he was baptized, he went straight away up out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened uh, unto him. Secondly, it says, that, and he saw the Holy Spirit of God descending uh, like a dove and lighting upon him. So Jesus was baptized, and when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. And then finally, the text goes on. This is in Matthew 3. And it says, And lo, a voice, that's his Father in heaven, said, This Jesus is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So in this one compact text from Matthew 3, we see that there is a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So this is our, what we covered also in more detail in our prior video. And if you hadn't seen that, you might want to go back and take a look at that. All right, let's proceed with today's study now. So now let's investigate God's salvation plan. Where did this salvation plan occur? How did it develop, etc.? So we're going to look at how the Godhead uh, in from the foundations of the world, God had wanted to create a large family that they could love and that would love them back. So in Genesis 1, 26, we read, then the Godhead said, let us make mankind, I added that, let us make mankind in our image. So what do you notice here? We notice that the words us and our are used, and this indicates that there is more than one God. So right from the very beginning in Genesis, we get the hint that there are more than one God. So the Godhead wanted their family to totally trust their loving guidance and follow the family's love commandments. So the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit they operate within some principles that we're going to get into right now. 
So what are the family's love commandments? Now, you may not have often heard them referred to as this, but this is what I'm calling them, the family's love commandments. So Jesus, Jesus shared with us these two love commandments when he was on earth. So what were they? And by the way, before I showed you them, the three gods in heaven, the Godhead, they go by these love commandments. That's how they treat each other. So everything that they want us to follow in terms of the commandments, they follow themselves. Isn't that wonderful? So Jesus was talking with his disciples one day, and a lawyer came by. And the lawyer asked Jesus what I call a trick question. So what was that trick question? Well, the, he, the lawyer said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Now, he knew there were Ten Commandments, and he was trying to sort of cause an argument with Jesus, you might say, and have to ask Jesus what is the greatest commandment of all these Ten. So what did, what did Jesus answer him? How did he answer him? Well, he said, Jesus replied, and he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. And I've added, just as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit love one another. So this was his answer to this lawyer. He said, this is the first and greatest commandment. So that was kind of an interesting answer, wasn't it? He didn't say number three was the most important or number seven was the most important. He went right down to the root of the, of the question. What is the most important thing? And it's, he says, love. Love your Father, the Holy Spirit, and God. Just like uh, the, whole, the Trinity loves each other, we want you to love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then he also said, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, and the law and that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And that's found in Matthew 22. The answer to the question was very simple. And Jesus told us what the two greatest commandments that heaven follows. Love God with all your heart and with your soul and your mind and love each other. Love your neighbors as yourself. So in creating their family, the Godhead wanted to give their family something very special. And what was that thing that he wanted to give them? He wanted to give them a free will, a free will. So in giving each family member a free will meant that the Godhead would not force their children to obey and follow their love commandments like mindless robots. That's not what God wanted. He could have created us like a robot, but he wanted us to use our free will to worship him. So the Godhead wanted their family to voluntarily, of their own free will, love and respect each member of the Godhead and each other. Now, take a look at this. Please consider this here now. God, the Godhead created a perfect environment in heaven when he created the angels. And this perfect environment the angels could live and love and be productive and have a blessed, happy life. This is the environment that the angels came into after Jesus created them. So Jesus even lived among the angels in heaven as one of them. They could see him and touch him. He was their friend. He was the leader of all the angels in heaven. He was their archangel. He was the leader of the angels. So just imagine this. All the angels in heaven could see and touch and talk directly 
with the actual God, that's Jesus, that created them. Now, wouldn't you love to have that today where you could just go and visit with Jesus directly and talk to him and listen to him, see what he has to say about things? But the angels in heaven had this blessing in heaven that Jesus walked among, among them, right with them. So all the angels could see that the God, Jesus, was humble and loving and cared for their every need. So they could see this directly. They didn't have to read it out of a book. They would see this every day as things went along. So here's the question I want you to consider. So with a perfect environment in heaven, how did sin occur? How did one third of the angels in heaven sin and they were ultimately kicked out of heaven? How did this happen? So here is, a, is my understanding of how it possibly happened. So did the possibility that sin would arise in heaven, did it catch God unprepared? Was this something that sort of God woke up one morning and he saw a whole bunch of uh, maybe thousands or maybe millions, I don't know, of angels outside of his door kind of protesting his, his reign, his rulership of heaven? How did it happen? How did sin happen in heaven and did God, did it catch God unprepared? Well, the answer is no. God was prepared for this possibility. So let's delve into this a little bit further and see what my explanation for this is. So this is very difficult for me to explain. So uh, I hope you take a look at this and see if it makes any sense. My wife, Linda, and I have been working on this so study here for uh, quite a long time, many, many weeks. And this is our uh, attempt here to explain to you how this could occur. And I, I want to say this right now, that this will aid us later on as we study the tabernacle and as we study the censer being cast, cast down. So this will all build upon each other as we go along. So let's take a look at this. Well, we have to go back to the in time before the Godhead created angels or humans. So we got to get in our flying machine and go back in time to the beginning or the foundations of the world. So let's consider this Bible text. And all the people, that's the lost souls. As we get through this text here, you'll see that, that it, that's what it means. And all the lost souls who belong to this world right here and worship the beast. That's the devil. The devil is the beast. So what can we say about them? The lost souls are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb. It's the Lamb's book of life. And who, that's Jesus, agreed to be slaughtered before the world or anyone in it, even the angels or us, so Jesus agreed before anyone was created that he would be our sacrifice. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Let's go on. So in Revelation 13, 8, and it, other places also, teaches us some important facts here. So number one, the plan of redemption where Jesus would be slain for our sins was conceived before Jesus created anything, before he created the stars, the universe, before he created the uh, angels in heaven, before he created us on earth. The plan of redemption preceded all of that. And everyone's name who would accept, that's a positive, everyone's name of those who would accept Jesus' salvation offer and be saved, their name was written in the book of life, and that was written by God the Father before they were even created. 
Now you can see here I have a little mock-up, a little prop here, of the Book of Life. And this Book of Life has seven seals on it. And this is where the names of everyone who would accept Jesus as a, their Savior, their names were written in that book. Also, the names of the souls that were lost, their names were originally written in here from the foundations of the world. But God the Father looked into the future and he saw that these particular people would not accept Jesus' sacrifice for them. And so he went in and he struck out their name from this book of life. So only the people that are saved are in the book of life right now. So the, the Bible teaches us that the three gods have different powers. Now this is going to be a little uh, hard for some people to understand here, but try and follow me and you might want to review this a couple times. So how, how do they have different powers? Well, Jesus stated in the Bible that the Father is the only one who can see into the future. Not Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, but the Father only has this ability. So you might say, well, Art, let me see this from the Bible. I agree. Let's see what the Bible has to say about this. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit voluntarily, I believe, gave up their powers of omniscience or foreknowledge. So only God the Father has this ability to see into the future. Only the Father, not Jesus and not the Holy Spirit. So Jesus stated that he did not have foreknowledge when he commented on a future event. So Jesus, these are words from him. So let's take a look at these. He says, however, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son, that's Jesus himself, not even the angels in heaven or Jesus knows the day or the hour, but only God the Father. Only the Father knows. So Jesus here is reinforcing the concept that the Father has knowledge of the future where he doesn't, and neither does the Holy Spirit. So the God the Father's foreknowledge saw that sin would arise in Lucifer's heart. Now, Lucifer is the first angel that Jesus created. And that Lucifer would not repent, even after many long counseling sessions with God. So Lucifer, in his heart, and I will cover this more in our next video, so look for that. But Lucifer, uh, in his heart, he wanted to do things that were sinful. And God tried to reason with him, but Lucifer would not listen. So based on the Father's foreknowledge, the Father created a mysterious plan. That's what the Bible calls it, a mysterious plan to save mankind. And he shared this plan with the other two gods. And when he shared this plan with them, look, look at what the, 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 they said. So this is Paul the Apostle in prison. He, he wrote the, the epistle from uh, Ephesians here. So he said, and this is God, that's God the Father's plan. So this is God's plan, both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news about Jesus, and sh they share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. That's you or I. We are God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promises of the blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. Now, this is a, a concept here. I'm not going to get into it in this video, but if you want, you can read Psalms 2.2. God promised Jesus that if he would go through with this plan of salvation, that Jesus would inherit the universe and all the people that he created. So I'm just touching on this today, but we will go into that further in another study. So continuing here. This is Ephesians 3, starting at 9. 
And so Paul, was, he says, Paul was chosen to explain to everyone the mysterious plan that God, the creator of everything, has kept secret from the beginning. This is from the foundations of the world. This mysterious plan has been kept secret from the foundations of the world. And this was his eternal plan. Now, look, to, look how this is written. This was God the Father's eternal plan. So God the Father put together this redemption plan, which he, God the Father, carried out through whom? Who did God the Father carry this out through? It says right here, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the Father came up with the plan, and Jesus carried it out. Isn't that amazing what the Bible tells us? You know, sometimes people say things and they can't back it up from the Bible, but I think this is pretty clear, don't you? So God the Father documented his mysterious plan in the names of everyone on earth who would accept the salvation offer in the Book of Life. This is, a, this is my little prop here, Book of Life. And then sealed the book shut with seven seals. And I got some little uh, kind of toy seal, uh, seals here and locks. But God has a high-tech book of life. I, I don't think it's physically a book. With all the things that man can do with CDs and memory sticks and computers and all, God has a way of documenting things that we have no idea. But we will learn. When we go to heaven, we will learn exactly how he has documented this. But it's, uh, it, it's called the Book of Life. So this book, with its top secret names of everyone who is saved, is still sealed today. You cannot open this book today. It doesn't, when you get, when a person comes to Jesus and is baptized, his, his name is not written into, into the book of life on that day. His name was written into the book of life before the, from the foundations of the earth, before he was even born. God the Father knew in advance. He could see into the future. He could see who would accept Jesus' sacrifice and who wouldn't. And everyone whose name stayed in the book of life, their name was not crossed out. It's still in there today. But the book has not ever been opened. But it will be opened at the great white throne judgment when we, at the end of a thousand years. So God's salvation plan. Well, what is it, Art? It's pretty simple in a way. God the Father conceived a plan to save their children from the penalty of sin, even before Jesus created us. So the Father's salvation plan is designed to eliminate the sin issue from the universe permanently, but it would take 6,000 years to be fully implemented. So God's issue was this. Sin first occurred in heaven, then second time it occurred on earth. God put together a plan that will guarantee that sin will never come up a third time. So this plan takes time for it to be fully implemented and carried out. It's actually going to take 6,000 years. And from my estimation from the Garden of Eden, uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, we are more than 6,000 years into this. So we're getting close to the end of the time here. So the entire Godhead, after God the Father explained the plan, they all willingly agreed to the Father's salvation plan. So this salvation plan was this. If sin should appear, then Jesus, the Creator God, would figuratively step in between the sinner and God's punishment, and Jesus would pay the sinner's penalty with his life. In Hebrews, we read in 7, 27, it says, unlike those other high priests, he's talking about the high priest that um, worked in the sanctuary on earth, in the, the temple, 
He, Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices every day. But Jesus is this once for all time when he offered himself as the sacrifice for people's sins. So just when we, we'll get into this, when we studied the sanctuary, people brought innocent lambs and other sacrifices to the altar on a daily basis to seek forgiveness for their sins. But those weren't really effective. They really didn't do anything in terms of forgiving their sins. The sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross for us that one time, it says here, it was once for all. So he doesn't need to do this again. He doesn't do this every day in heaven. There's no animals being sacrificed in heaven or on earth for our sins. Jesus did it once for all times. In Romans, we read, Romans 5, says, And yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God the Father and a new life for everyone. So because one person, that's Adam, disobeyed God the Father, many became sinners, but because one other person, that's Jesus, obeyed God the Father and, um, I should say, followed his plan, many will be made righteous. So in Romans 6, 23, we also read, For the wages of sin is death. This is a very famous quote. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus our Lord, through his sacrifice on the cross, and accepting that. So if a sinner accepts Jesus' offer of his death and sacrifice in place of their own penalty, their death, then that person would be saved. So in the Old Testament, you uses the sacrificial altar and its services primarily, I think, to teach the solemn sacrifice that God Jesus was going to voluntarily do for mankind. So they were, in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to Jesus' sacrifice. And that's what the sanctuary services were all about, to teach how that goes. So without the shedding of blood, we read in Hebrews, there is no forgiveness. Well, that's about it for our study today. Uh, I hope you've gotten a blessing from it, and you probably learned some new things, or I brought up some topics you never really thought about. So I suggest as much as possible, go back and look at this a couple times, get out your Bible, and follow along in your Bible, or your favorite text, or favorite translation, I should say, and take a look at it. So our next uh, video will be part 1B of this, and we will talk about Lucifer and what happened in heaven and how sin arose in heaven. So I appreciate you taking time to view this. And if you get a blessing from this, I would appreciate it if you could hit the, the like button if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, and that will help more people to see this video. Again, I want to thank you, and my wife Linda thanks you, and we appreciate your uh, loyalty. Thank you. Thanks again.